Welcome all of you to the 46th live webinar on orthopedic principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Robert Ashford from Leicester, United Kingdom. Rob was appointed at Leicester as a consultant orthopedic and musculoskeletal tumor surgeon in 2008, working jointly at Nottingham University Hospitals, following fellowships in Sydney and at the RNOH. He's a lead clin clinician of the East Midlands Sarcoma Service. His clinical practice is orthopedic oncology and lower limb arthroplasty. His research interests are metastatic bone disease, palliative orthopedic surgery, genetics of soft tissue sarcoma, and outcome measures in sarcoma. He was co-chair of the British Orthopedic Oncology Society Working Party on Surgical Management of Metastatic Bone Disease. He was chosen as an ABC Traveling Fellow in 2014 and in 2019. He was promoted to honorary professor at the Leicester Cancer Research Center and elected president of the British Orthopedic Oncology Society. So it is my honor to invite Professor Rob Ashford for this live webinar. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Hitesh, for the invitation to speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about soft tissue sarcomas in the FRCS ORF uh, and how you might meet them. And the most common way you'll meet them is in the vivas and you'll be given an image and it might be something like this. So this is an ultrasound scan that's been done on a, a chap with a painless lump in his thigh. And you can see the lump fairly clearly. It's marked out for you in terms of size, but there are a number of worrying features on this scan. So you can see its size is 5.7 centimeters in its longest dimension, so that's worrying. It says that it's deep to biceps. And so you go on and get an MRI scan. And that MRI scan shows the lesion in more detail. And you can see a series of scans here that show that it's heterogeneous, it's large, it's deep. And all of those would be worrying features, even though it's encapsulated or pseudo encapsulated, you'd be worried that this is a sarcoma. Here again is another one. Again, the features that you'd be concerned about, it's deep, it's big, and it's heterogeneous. You might get given a plain radiograph and soft tissue sarcomas can show some effects on the plain radiograph. This, this is a lad who's got a uh, painful lump on the lateral aspect of his calf. You can see a bit of diffuse swelling there, but what you can also see is some bone erosion of the fibula. And when you get the MRI scan, this shows a big, solid, deep mass encasing the fibula. And again, that would be a worrying feature. The fact there's bone erosion means it's there for some time. This lad had neurofibromatosis and when he was staged, uh, that's the mass you can see there, when he was staged, he had a PET CT scan that showed a further lesion in his mediastinum and one in his contralateral thigh. All of those would be worrying features. As it was, they turned out to be neurofibromata, and he underwent a resection of his fibula as well as the soft tissue mass. So those are just some examples of when you might meet soft tissue sarcomas in your exam. So what I want to do is talk a bit about how you would manage them and how you would approach them. So for those of you that don't know, Leicester's in the middle of England, uh, the heart of England, it's famous for, for some pop music, Shawadi Wadi for the older ones, ones listening, Kasabian for the younger ones. It's really famous for being the last resting place of, of Richard III, but actually most people know Leicester because of when they won the Premiership or Premier League. So as far as the exam is concerned, this slide is the one that matters. This is what you need to know for your, for your exam. You make a diagnosis, you send them to a specialist center, they're managed by an MDT, they're taken out, you might give some drugs or some radiotherapy, and they're followed up. If you stick to those principles, you will pretty much cover soft tissue sarcomas for the exam to a level you need to. But that would be a fairly boring webinar, so I'll have to do a bit more than that. Um, so in 2006, NICE published the uh, Improving Outcomes for People with Sarcoma Manual, and then uh, back in 2015, they issued some quality standards, which were an evolution of this previous document. And the quality standards are fairly straightforward. 
And whilst they're issued for England, they apply pretty much wherever you are. They recommend that they're multidisciplinary teams that have pathways for referral and diagnosis for people with suspected sarcoma. They should have their management plan confirmed by a sarcoma MDT and treatment delivered by someone appropriate. Outcomes should be published by the MDTs. Specialist sarcomas should be dealt with in specialist units, for example, retroperitoneal sarcomas. And sarcoma, uh, surgery for sarcoma should be performed by people who are members of an MDT and hence understand the biology of the disease. And then the final statement is that there should be key worker support. This is not just about taking the lump out of people, it's about how you manage the patients as a whole. And never has that been more important than times like this. So what about the epidemiology of sarcomas? Sarcomas account for 1.4% of new cancers, but 2% of cancer mortality. There are about 20 to 30 per million of the population. So that equates in the UK to about five and a half thousand a year, of which almost nine out of 10 of them are soft tissue. And the five year survival is about 55% across the board. The message, however, is you can get them pretty much any age, and any site in the body. So with soft tissue sarcomas, the problem is that they're a hundred times less common than benign tumors. So the approach has to be, don't miss the sarcoma. If you, if you regard everything as benign, you're gonna run into trouble. So it's about trying to recognize when something is suspicious or worrying so that you don't miss it because malignant soft tissue sarcomas are locally aggressive, they're capable of invasion, they're capable of destruction, they locally recur, and they metastasize. But they're a very heterogeneous group. Some of them rarely metastasize, some of them metastasize readily, some of them recur locally frequently, some of them will rarely recur locally. So differentiation is important, Grading is important. Historically, soft tissue sarcomas have been regarded as a single entity, but increasingly the biology of them as individual subtypes histologically is important. So what are the clinical features you're looking for? On the whole, a, a bigger mass is more worrying, a deep mass is more worrying, something that's rapidly growing is more worrying. A soft tissue mass with pain needs to be considered. If you've got calcification within it on a plain radiograph, that's also something that should get you thinking this is concerning. And change in size over time is important. I think a number of us use fruit and vegetables as the uh, size because of consistency. If you ask a number of different patients how big it was and they tell you in centimeters, generally that's fairly random. But if you ask them to say, how big was it when it started? Oh, it was pea size and it's grown to plum size. Everyone knows what you're talking about. So if you look at the four risk factors that NICE previously counted as red flag signs, that's big, as in bigger than five centimeters, deep, painful and growing. 25% of soft tissue sarcomas had all four of those features and another 25% of them had three out of four in this large series from Guy's Hospital. And here you can see an MRI scan that's fat suppressed image that shows a large soft tissue uh, mass in the subcutaneous tissue, but invading into the deep compartment. So this is painful, it's growing, it's big, it's deep, it's got all four uh, risk factors and was a synovial sarcoma on biopsy. Their age distribution is variable depending on the subtype. So you've got two subtypes here, you've got synovial sarcoma in the orange and you've got liposarcoma in the red. And you can see that liposarcoma is a, a disease of the older population compared to synovial sarcoma. And that holds true across the board with the, the rhabdomyosarcomas being one of the more common cancers in the you know, teenage and childhood population, then synovial sarcomas in a, in a younger adult group. And then as you get older, the different sarcomas coming in 
with a higher uh, incidence and it, it, that's their typical age range. As far as sight is concerned, half of the sarcomas there are occur in uh, connective and soft tissue. And then of those, the majority occur in the limbs, but they can occur in the trunk wall and they can occur anywhere. How are they classified? They're classified as either soft tissue or bone, and then visceral or non-visceral. They're classified by differentiation. There are over a hundred different subtypes in the current WHO classification. There's just a, a, a small selection of them, but there are, they are all different. So in terms of a soft tissue sarcomas, Undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma is, by, is the commonest, followed by liposarcoma. Again, you see the differing age groups, and then the other sarcomas all are in a smaller uh, group with some really, what these are the commonest ones. And then there are, as I say, the best part of 90 other different subtypes. What about the etiology and pathogenesis of it? Well, there are four things that apply here. There's environmental factors, oncogenic viruses, immunologic factors, and genetic factors. As far as environmental factors are concerned, trauma has been uh, reputed to cause sarcoma. There's no good clear evidence for it, and it's predominantly anecdotal. Similarly, surgery, burns, plastic implants have all been uh, suggested that they cause it. Chemicals can, can have been shown to cause cancers, uh, as with other, other cancers, asbestos, vinyl chloride are related, and then radiation is an important one that we'll talk about in a minute. As far as implant and trauma related, the largest series out there is a, a series of 12 orthopedic implant related sarcomas. When you consider the number of orthopedic implants that go into people, 12 is really a very, very small number indeed. Everything else is pretty much just case reports that are out there. As far as post irradiation sarcomas, there's a number of criteria that uh, need to be fulfilled for these to be post, but related to the radiotherapy. Um, the criteria originally published by Kayan and subsequently amended by Arlen, and they are um, that the sarcoma has to develop in a irradiated field there has to be histological confirmation of both pathologies. Initially, it was suggested that there needed to be a latency of three years between the radiotherapy and subsequently developing the sarcoma. That's been brought down to six months now, as long as there are two clear different pathologies. And the region that bears the tumor had to be normal prior to irradiation. Without those criteria, then it's not a true irradiation induced sarcoma. As far as oncogenic viruses, EBV can cause smooth muscle tumours in H HIV positive or therapeutically immunocompromised patients. HHV8 can cause Kaposi's sarcoma. From an immunologic ones, immunodeficiency can lead to leiomyosarcomas and acquired regional immunodeficiency, for example, chronic lymphedema can lead to angiosarcomas. All of these are rare but recognised causes. And then genetic factors, that the ones that are very, are not very common, most common ones are bilateral retinoblastoma being associated with secondary sarcoma due to germline deletion of the RB1 locus and Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, which right results in germline deletion of the P53 locus results in familial rhabdomyosarcoma and other sarcomas. This is the current list that are, are there, but these are increasing all the time. So neurofibromatosis and MPNST, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour, that was the case I showed right at the start. Imaging, it's fairly standard. So the workhorse for soft tissue sarcomas is an MRI scan, but generally the first line investigation will be an ultrasound, which is user dependent. Uh, a report done by a musculoskeletal radiologist that says this looks like a sarcoma would be a lot more worrying. One that's done by someone that says 
this is a lipoma, but a sarcoma cannot be excluded, which is what we see an awful lot, is fairly useless for, from the point of view of uh, primary care. You need focused ultrasound, incompetent hands, and sensible opinions. Plain radiographs looking for bone erosion or calcification, as I mentioned, can sometimes be useful. But the workhorse is the MRI scan for extremity masses. It allows for good delineation between the tumour and anatomy. It allows you to note where the, the important blood vessels and nerves are to plan your resection. CTs are useful for abdominal and retroperitoneal sarcomas and to stage them. PET CT scans are useful for detecting recurrences when you have to make radical treatment decisions and determining grades of tumour. For example, if you've got an unusual mass, the PET CT can enable you to target the biopsy appropriately. Biopsies, most of the patients present to us with uh, painless masses and will often have been diagnosed initially as a lipoma or a hematoma, which can lead to delay. The workhorse for us is a core needle biopsy under ultrasound control, but sometimes under CT control. We will occasionally do excision biopsies of small superficial lesions. You just need to be aware of how you're going to re-resect it if it turns out to be something, because we all get caught out with superficial small lesions turning out to be a sarcoma occasionally. In terms of an incision biopsy, if you do need to do one, it should be done on the lines of standard sarcoma principles. So a longitudinal incision with no tourniquet, although if you do use one, you can need to deflate it beforehand. So uh, as I say, core needle biopsy, but most of our, for open biopsies, they should be done at the tertiary center. The surgical approach for your resection needs to be uh, planned so that your biopsy tract is in the line of that. Longitudinal incision. You don't elevate tissue flaps, you go directly down onto the tumor. You then take an adequate piece of it and you want the junction of normal tissue and of the tumor so that the pathologist can see both. You don't want something from the center of a lesion because that's often necrotic. And then coming out, meticulous hemostasis, if you've used the tourniquet, let it down before you close. You've only violated one compartment that way. The exception to that is if there's a neurovascular structure in the way, you don't want to violate that. You don't want to strip or move those because that will make your life more difficult when it comes to resection. We typically use frozen sections to confirm we've got diagnostic tissue. We don't look for a diagnosis from the frozen section. What we look for is the pathologist to say, yes, you've given me adequate tissue so that I can uh, make a diagnosis. And then once you've got a diagnosis, you stage the patient and the AJCC eighth edition, which is the current one, essentially recognizes the size of the tumor. And this has increased in recent times and the number of uh, T categories, but you've got the small, going from small to large. So less than five, five to 10, 10 to 15 or more than 15, nodes present or absent and METs present or absent. And that staging gives you the overall stage groups. And the staging system predicts the survival, it predicts the risk of metastasis, but it doesn't predict local recurrence at all. And the higher the stage, the poorer the survival. From a grading point of view, across the board, about a third are low grade and the rest are high grade with moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated, undifferentiated, all being lumped together as high grade tumors. What about outcome related to tumor size? Well, if you look across the board, if you present with a, a tumor that's five or under, your survival at four years is 60%. As it gets bigger, your survival drops. So the average tumor in the UK currently presents as the size of a can of baked beans, which is 10, just over 10 centimeters. If we can get that size down to the size of a golf ball, that is a substantial improvement in survival. And that's been a campaign that's been going on for a long time. 
yet the average presentation size remains much the same. And the only way we can get that down is by recognizing the possibility of something being a sarcoma. What are the bad things? What are very poor prognostic indicators? Well, it's, if you've got a tumor that's definitely, that's, got, that's metastatic at diagnosis, that's definitely a bad sign. If you've got a tumor that's big, that's bad. If you've got a tumor that's deep, that's bad, probably. If you're older, that's not good for you. Um, worryingly, if you're older than 50, well, I'm older than 50 now, that's not good. So I don't want to be getting a sarcoma. If your tumor is managed badly, so you've got residual tumor after the local treatment, so a positive surgical margin, that's bad. And there's increasingly ev evidence that having a raised neutrophil, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and CRP are poor prognostic indicators. And then the histologic grade can sometimes be bad. And if you've got nuclear P53 immunoreaction, that might be bad. There's further work going on about that. We talked about stage. There you go. That's the clear evidence. If you've got a stage one cancer, you do uh, sarcoma, you do better than if you've got a stage two and stage three. It's predictive of that. What about recurrence? Your risk of uh, recurrence go up with bigger tumors. With local, if you if you've got a, a recurrent tumor that's been managed elsewhere, if it's high grade. And if it's deep, all of them are poor prognostic indicators. Local recurrence is an interesting one because the um, odds ratio crosses over one. So there's still not clear evidence that ha having a local recurrence impacts on survival. As I said right at the start, treatment of soft tissue sarcoma is a multidisciplinary approach. You can't do this on your own and you shouldn't do this on your own. This is a work as a team. And the options that the team will consider as surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy. And you need to have your treatment intent sorted. So are you trying to cure the patient or are you trying to palliate the patient? And that depends on patient factors and disease factors. So if you've got a very frail patient with a small tumor, you might, might make a different decision to that if that patient was much younger or much less frail. Similarly, if you've got a solitary metastasis, you may be more aggressive than if you've got multiple metastases. But in terms of things, this is one of my favorite slides. This is the effect on cure of uh, the different treatment options. So surgical, the size of the yellow circle is the a uh, proportion of patients cured by the treatment option. So by far and away, the most patients are cured by surgery, which takes a couple of hours. A few patients are cured by radiotherapy, which takes a few weeks. And the occasional patient is cured by chemotherapy, uh, which takes six months. That's a slightly flippant view, but it does irritate my oncologic colleagues. I'm going to talk about radiotherapy and chemotherapy first, and then I'll come on to surgery. So radiotherapy can be used on its own or in combination with other treatment modalities. And across the board, about 50% of all cancer patients receive radiotherapy. It can be used in curative or palliative roles, and it can be done to preserve organ function, for example, in the larynx or prostate, where you get less... Uh, functional de deficit compared to surgical resection. There's some cases where you might get better cosmesis. So some, some of the skin sarcomas will do better with uh, radiotherapy than uh, function, uh, cosmetically than with surgery. It is however limited by critical structures and the patients must be able to endure treatment. If you've got someone who lives 50 miles away from the nearest radiotherapy center and they're having to come in daily for five weeks, that's a fairly large impact on their life. But as far as um, radiotherapy in combination with, with other treatments, small low grade tumors were resected with clear surgical margins, almost certainly don't need radiotherapy. Do you give radiotherapy before or after surgery? 
I'll come on to that in a second. Radiotherapy, we know, improves local, improves local, 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 control, local control, poor surgery. So if you have macroscopically, uh, macroscopic disease present at the end of your surgery, radiotherapy isn't going to sort that out. So, but if you've got no, if you've got no evidence of microscopic disease, then it may reduce the risk of local recurrence, or it does reduce the risk of local recurrence. But whether that leads to improved survival is controversial. So, for sarcomas, do we give it as induction before surgery, or do we give it as adjuvant after surgery? Well, if you give it as an induction dose, it's a smaller dose. And it's easier for the oncologist because they can see the tumour there. They're not guessing where the tumour was and what you've moved around to cover the, the defect. So it's much easier for them to plan. So it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Well, it isn't. Because if you give it as induction, your wounds fall apart. So it's fairly challenging from a surgical point of view. But what do you do? Where's the dilemma? Do you accept more wound complications? versus lower toxicity, or would you rather have less wound complications? There's been a big shift in recent times towards induction radiotherapy. And a lot of it was brought out by this work that came out of Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto from the O'Sullivan study. And the disadvantage to pre-op radiotherapy is wound problems. But by a year, the scores, the functional scores for both pre-op and post-op radiotherapy are much the same. And then as you go down the line, the late complications of fibrosis, stiffness, and edema are all reduced in the group that have pre-op radiotherapy. So in the longer term, it's better for the patient, but it can be a fairly stormy ride. The other thing is pathological fractures due to radiotherapy and the dose it, in the high dose radiotherapy patients, those who have the really high dose, so those are the post-op radiotherapy ones, there is a significantly higher risk of radiation induced pathological fracture. And they can be a nightmare to treat with the high infection rates and a high uh, risk of not healing and a, indeed a high amputation rate in that group of patients. So that's radiotherapy. Chemotherapy, well, it can, chemotherapy as a whole can be given by a number of different administration routes. It can be given orally, intravenously, intraarterially, into a cavity, intrathecally. Um, it tends to be intravenous for sarcomas. Um, you can do it alone or in combination with surgery and other, uh, other treatments, so chemo radiotherapy. You can give a combination drug versus uh, single drugs. And the combinations work at different phases of the cell cycle to kill cells. Um, unfortunately, the chemotherapy kills normal cells as well as uh, tumor cells. So that is the limiting factor. So in sarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas, it's usually intravenous. It's rarely induction chemotherapy apart from a certain couple of subtypes. So rhabdos and synovial sarcomas, you might give induction chemotherapy for rhabdos, you should do. It's usually reserved for a palliative uh, treatment. Standard chemotherapy first line is either doxorubicin or doxorubicin and iphosphamide, depending on patient fitness. So as far as surgery is concerned, was, as a surgeon, we chop every, every tumor out, but it can be limited by where the tumor is, the patient's medical condition, and the extent of the tumour. And often we will do it in combination with radiotherapy or chemotherapy. You need to be clear whether you're out to cure or palliate the patient. And you might be bolder in terms of your resections for curative treatments than you would be or should be a palliative. Limb sparing or amputation is often the case of the discussions here. And the majority of cases we would treat with limb sparing surgery, our amputation rate for limb sarcomas is around about 8% across the board. The, um, the Rosenberg study there shows that surgery plus radiotherapy for limb salvage 
shows no difference in survival to compared to amputation, but there was a higher local recurrence rate. But amputation is still sometimes in, indicated, it depends where the tumor is, if, the, if there's neurovascular or bone involvement, then you may need to go for an amputation. In terms of resection, you need an adequate margin if there's no plan for post-operative radiotherapy. If, and that can involve a wide margin. They talk about two centimeters in some countries, five centimeters in some countries. There's no universal agreement across the pond about what a wide margin is. Negative margins may be adequate for post-operative if you're giving post-operative radiotherapy. So that what I mean by that is at the edge of your tissue, there is no tumor. And that can be an uninvolved tissue plane, or it can be a couple of cells that it depends where in the body and the particular compartment that tumor is. If you have an unplanned positive margin, that increases your local re recurrence rate really quite substantially. We don't routinely do nodal dissections because there's only two to 3% of patients have lymph node metastasis with sarcoma. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of surgical resection, your planned resection could be radical, it could be wide, it could be marginal, or it can just be a biopsy. A marginal excision would be where you just take the uh, tumor, for a wide excision, you get the tumor and you get the reactive zone around it. So the tumor is in red, the reactive zone is the white zone around it, and the green is the normal tissue in the compartment. A radical resection would take the whole of that compartment. The majority of our resections for sarcoma are wide. Talking a bit more about positive margins, Craig Durand published this work from Toronto. Um, looking at planned versus unplanned positive margins. So in some cases, you know that you're not going to get a wide margin. For example, when it invades onto, the, onto a nerve and you want, that's a major nerve and you want to preserve it, a positive margin there was shown to have a local recurrence rate of about 3%. If you have an unplanned positive margin, it was 37%. So, R0 is a wide excision with, with microscopically clear, R1 is microscopically positive, R2 is macroscopically positive. I couldn't do what I do without the help of my plastic surgery colleagues. We end up doing some very large resections and there's a reconstructive ladder that they'll work on. I'm allowed to go up onto the first and second rung and then they throw me out. So. I can do some primary closures and they will then say, come on, you go and have a cup of coffee, we'll do the rest. Um, so it'd be rude not to really. But the plastic surgeons do a huge job for us and we increasingly, with the use of radiotherapy, use lots more soft tissue transfers and flaps to cover our defects. In terms of metastatic disease, unfortunately, as I said, about 50% of these patients succumb to the disease by five years. The most common site of metastasis from a soft tissue sarcoma is the lung, but visceral sarcomas can metastasize to the liver. The median survival from the development of metastatic disease is just under a year. But if you've got isolated pulmonary metastasis, you can get a reasonable five year survival if you can surgically remove them all. If you've got more than three mets, that's a bad prognosticator. There's been a gentle increase in five year survival over the decades, but not substantially so. And I don't think we're going to see a dramatic increase in this, despite the use of patients being treated within dedicated sarcoma centers until there is a substantial improvement in the oncologic treatment of these diseases. So going back to the overall slide, the most important thing for the exam make your diagnosis, send it to a specialist centre, manage it through an MDT, take it out properly with a bit of help from your oncologic uh, colleagues and follow the patient up to see if they get metastatic disease. I couldn't do what I do without the team around me of plastic surgeons, oncologists, pathologists, specialist nurses, radiologists, 
and everybody else who's involved and they make my life much easier. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof, for that brief. Prof, for that brief. And uh, it was really enlightening for everyone. The audience, I think they're really excited listening to you. Uh, there have been a couple of queries, questions that have come up. Okay. Yeah, one is uh, a, in a common clinical scenario. For example, you see a 30 year old man with a swelling around the knee. How do yeah. you really suspect that it could be a soft tissue sarcoma? So it, it, a lot of it, it goes down to the history. If, if you know how long it's been there, if it's been there 10 years, it's unlikely to be anything. Although we do see things that, that uh, are, do turn out to be sarcomas that have been there a long time. Classically, it will be the history of it. Is it changing? Is it rapidly growing? I think you just need to be suspicious. And ultrasounds are very easy to get, but uh, they're not particularly specific. But with cross-sectional imaging, you, you've got to be you've got to be aware of it. If you don't think sarcoma, you'll miss the sarcoma. So it's about suspicion. Okay, Prof. The other one is regarding, uh, you have mentioned about liposarcoma. Yes. Because it's a very common scenario that uh, one sees multiple lipomas in the body. Sometimes it's painful. So when is, when, is there a, con a condition where, I mean, you can suspect that it's going to get converted to a liposarcoma. For example, the location, because I, I remember uh, a location is very important, the inner side of the thigh or the interscapular area, if you see a lipoma, the chance of getting converted to a liposarcoma is going to be high. Okay, so in terms of lipomas transforming into liposarcomas, essentially it doesn't, it doesn't happen. <laughs> the Atypical lipomatous tumors can convert into sarcomas, but will usually do that after they've recurred. The atypical lipomatous tumors are fatty tumors. They're almost all deep and they're almost all big. So it, it is really, really, really rare for a lipoma to convert into a sarcoma. They are usually different entities. If you've got someone who's got multiple lipomas that hurt, they're almost always angiolipomas. So that's a lipoma with its own internal blood structure and that, that's why they get pain. As you say, the thigh is the more common area for it to be a sarcoma. But if you've got a biopsy proven lipoma, then pretty much never will it convert. Okay, Prof. The other one is, uh, how often do you require a joint resection? For example, do you require a, a limb sparing surgery and an arthroplasty simultaneously when you do a resection? For a, for a soft tissue sarcoma, very rarely. So we, we will occasionally, we frequently take periosteum, we will sometimes take bone, um, but it is not very often. And uh, something about synovial sarcoma. Some people yeah. say that the synovial sarcoma is a misnomer. It actually does not arise from the synovium. Is it true? That is true. It, it was called a synovial sarcoma because the cells look like syn synovial cells. So where do they come from generally? Locations. So where do they arise? They arise yeah. at... They arise in the soft tissues, just like everywhere, just like all the other sorts of soft tissue sarcoma. It's just, it is that resemblance that is um, the, the cause of that. Now, the synovial sarcomas are the most common soft tissue sarcomas in the foot and ankle by quite a considerable way. Okay. So because, that's one specific type. Yeah, I remember having learned the X18 translocation, very specific for synovial sarcoma, right? Yeah. And do you yeah, do there are a few so there are a few specific translocations, and more are being discovered all the time. And uh, do you think uh, we need to get these done before going for our real procedure? So, if you know it it is a sarcoma, then unless it's going to influence your 
probably your non-surgical management, then I think it's less important to know exactly which subtype of sarcoma it is because that it's about a third of patients, the biopsy to the definitive resection subtype will change. That's not an issue. What is an issue is the benign to malignant change. So if you get a diagnosis that's called, that said, this is not worrying, and then you take it out and it is, that's a big issue. Because usually you won't have taken it out with a, a, a wide margin. And among these sarcomas, which are the ones that are uh, chemosensitive and radiosensitive generally? And which are the ones that are chemoresistant and radioresistant in general? So it, it, it can be very strange because with soft tissue sarcomas, you can have two patients with virtually identical pathology and they behave differently. But as a whole, rhabdomyosarcomas, synovial sarcomas show um, chemosensitivity. And so we, we will use it for those. In the States they will, or, and parts of Europe, they will use chemotherapy for the bigger high grade tumors. In the UK, we don't do that yet. Whether that will change depends on increasing evidence, I guess. Um, radiotherapy, myxoid liposarcoma is a really, really radiosensitive. So we would pretty much use pre-op radiotherapy for all of those. Um, myxofibrosarcomas are a challenge because they have lots of um, little tentacles that you can't see. They grow down around fascial planes and it's not uncommon for us to get positive margins with those. So we've gone down the two-stage surgery line with those. We we resect them, we leave the wound open, we put a vac on it, and we wait for the pathology to know we've got clear margins before we reconstruct. Because if you put a free flap on somebody and then you get positive margins and you have to look at re-resect, that's a disaster. Okay, Prof. The other one is you had a very brilliant slide that said at each age, what is the particular sarcoma that is prevalent? For example, you have a rhabdomyosarcoma in a very young child, and then synovial sarcoma, and as you grow, it changes. So how is the prognosis generally in rhabdomyosarcoma as well as synovial? Does so any correlation? The, the rhabdos, are, because they're a pediatric disease, they're very different. Um, and they can respond beautifully to chemotherapy. Again, some of them recur very, very rapidly. You get recurrence in two years and poor prognosis. For each of them, there are different subtypes that uh, the prognosis varies in. And, but over, we, we don't have the numbers and really this needs international collaboration so we know what the prognosis of the different subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma is. And, and th this is work that's happened more recently where we've started to work looking at the individual pathological subtypes because within the subtypes, for example, synovial sarcoma, you're not, you have uh, monophasic, you have biphasic, you have heavily calcified, there are three, three or four different subgroups and they behave differently. For example, the heavily calcified doesn't respond to chemotherapy anything like as well as the other ones do. Until we've got that data, we're not really going to know the answers. I think there's a working group called a Sarcoma Alliance, right? Which is looking into all That's right, yeah. Okay. And, and, and many of the bone sarcoma studies are international collaborations. And increasingly, we're working across the country and across the world to try and find some answers to this. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think there are no more queries and uh, you've tried to address almost all the questions that have come up in the chat box. It was a very great honor to have you on board and we are extremely grateful to you for coming and-, and Pleasure, life. thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, Prof. I'll Bye -bye. Thank you.